Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we praise you and thank you for your grace into our lives. And we thank you, Father, as by your grace you establish all things. And Father, we continue to pray that you grant the spirit of wisdom and revelation to our hearts and to our lives as we move into the fullness of the depth of your will for us. We ask, O oh God, that you continue to work your will in our lives. We seek to do only your will, to fulfill your will, to finish your will, and to always remain in your will. And we give you all the worship, glory, and honor for all your working in our lives through your Holy Spirit. Even now, open our eyes to understanding, to understand and receive your word. The engrafted word that is able to establish our hearts and our lives in you. We give you all worship, glory, and honor, Father, forevermore. In Jesus' name, Amen. This is the last Sunday of the month, and every last Sunday we go on an evangelistic series where we touch on topics that will be of in interest, general interest to people. And uh, last month we talked about how the world began, how the world came to be as it is today. And uh, this morning we are going to touch on how sin came into the world, how we reach the state that we are in from the spiritual side. So as you look at the story in the Bible, tells us if you have the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and also John chapter 1, verse 1, tells us that in the beginning was God and God created the heavens and the earth, and in John chapter 1, verse 1, it tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And uh, so in the beginning, before there was any creation, there existed God, Almighty God, the Hebrew word calls him, Elohim. And uh, God existed in three persons. He is not one person, three manifestations. He is three persons relating in a tri unity. And that's one of the most puzzling things to scholars and to people who do not understand what the Bible reveals about God. God exists in three persons. You heard probably of the Christian doctrine of Trinity. People have tried to express it in many ways. And sometimes they say the Trinity is like H2O, hydrogen oxide, chemical name for water. And water exists in a vapor form as steam, water vapor. Water exists in liquid form, as what you normally know. Water exists in solid form. And I say that is a picture of the Trinity. However, the illustration is good, but it's limited. It could be interpreted as one person, three manifestations. And uh, it would just be like uh, our uh, brother Albert Elias. Praise the Lord. Uh, he is one person. He is the husband to Sister Hope. And uh, so uh, that is one relationship. He is a father to Brother James here. And uh, there is a second relationship. And uh, he is my brother in the Lord. A third relationship. So it's one person, three relationships. That is not the picture of the Trinity, either. That is not the picture of the Trinity. The picture of the Trinity must be three persons working in unison together. Perhaps one of the best pictures is where you see a house that is built, and a house is sitting there, and along comes a person, and he comes, and he look at the house, he stands and he says, this is my house. I did, he, he is the 
architect. So he's out. He designed it. He designed the whole thing. He get it all built up. Then another person comes, looks at the house, and says, this is my house. He bought it. He's a landlord, the owner. My house. He's correct. So he walks back. Then the third person opens the door, looks out at us, and says, this is my house. I stay here. He's the tenant. So we have the father, the architect, the son, the one who shed his precious blood, and the Holy Spirit who lives in our heart. We are the house of God. And then it's a better picture of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God exists in three persons. No matter how we try to comprehend, that is it. Now in the Bible, there's a very strange quirk of grammar that they use in the Hebrew. The word for God in the Bible, actually, is plural in the Old Testament. See, Elo is the singular word for God. Elohim is a plural word for God. Simply speaking, it should be translated as God. Elohim. Now, in the English, you realize some forms of English, the plural is not an S by an I N, like cherub, cherubim, cherubim, right? Manabas, manabim. <laughs> All right, and uh, so. We add an I N instead of an X. And uh, so, in the Bible it says Elohim, which really speaking it should have been translated God. In the beginning was God. Say, you mean this morning, one God? What is that? That is, if you want to talk like that in that language, yes, yes, there are three gods. <laughs> but God gives a better picture. There is three persons of the Godhead. We call them the Godhead. And uh, the strange thing is that the Bible uses it this way. Normally, if we speak in English and we construct an English sentence, we would say, uh, for example, we would say, uh, he is here. And then we say, they are here. Right? We will say, uh, Ahmad, Akal, and Ramasami are here. We don't say, Ahmad, Akal, and Ramasami is here. We don't say that, right? We use the plural word to connect that uh, description, the word are. In the Bible, when it uses the Hebrew word, it says, strictly speaking, it says, God And that gives all the scholars and theologians a headache to translate. Singular and yet plural. Plural and yet singular. And under today, they haven't touched the question. That is still boggling the mind. How can it be singular yet plural? The Elohim is. And some others will say, what about the Bible when they say, Hero Israel, there is one God. See, there are two Hebrew words for one. One is a numerical one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Numerical one. The other is called union one. Uh, 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 what I call a picture of one. One. And when the Bible used the word one for God, it didn't use the word numerical one, it used the word union. That brings a stronger picture of Trinity. Any person who reads the New Testament will find that the Apostle Paul and the writers understood God to be three persons. At the beginning of every episode, they usually say, praise and blessings from God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, and sometimes they mention the Spirit of God. And that is a picture of, the, of more than one person. There's, there's no way you could, you could believe that uh, it was just one person's three manifestations. 
Uh, once in Australia, I went to Melbourne and was sitting in a church, and uh, I was not supposed to be there. And uh, uh, the, uh, somehow, I, I don't feel that I should have been there, but somehow I ended up there. And uh, that's why you, you, you meet people who are led by the Spirit to play your itinerary. And uh, so, and uh, everything feel, but since I was there, and uh, I set up the priest, so I preached. And when I was there, the Lord said, preach on the Trinity. So I preached on the Trinity. And after that, the pastor and the assistant pastor came and see me, took me to their office and said, we don't believe in the Trinity. There I was set up to preach, there were two more sessions. And they said, we don't want you to preach on the Trinity. <laughs> and uh, so the Holy Spirit helped me to ask him this question. When you go to heaven, you see God's throne. How many thrones do you see? Say, one throne? Two thrones? They did not want to answer because if they answer, they have to give the answer. So I answered for them. It must be very clear if the Father sits on the throne and the Son sits at his right hand, at least you see two thrones. At least. The Holy Spirit flows from the name of the throne. He is the only one person that, is, that doesn't seem to uh, reveal himself in our dispensation. Next time he will reveal and say the next dispensation. But at least you see two thrones there. If you say that God the Father is up there and Jesus sitting on his lap. One throne. So if God the Father is there, Jesus at his throne at his right hand, at least you can see the two person foot of God. The three persons. And that tells us that God chose it to reveal himself to us in three persons. Three separate persons working in unity. Never in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation do you find God working separately. Everything the Father wanted to do is what the Son wanted to do and what the Spirit wanted to do. Everything the Spirit wanted to do is what the Son wanted to do and what the Father wanted to do. Everything the Son wanted to do is what the Spirit wanted to do and what the Father wanted to do. Praise God. And it brings us to the point where what the Father wanted to do, what the Son wanted to do, what the Spirit wanted to do, we want to do. Where we would move with the Trinity of God. So God is three persons. In one accord. In the beginning was God. Percy Collier, if you heard that tape, incidentally, that those tape series are available, you can get it from a uh, state department, by John. And uh, Percy Collier went to heaven for six hours, six early hours. In heaven, there's no measurement. So on this he was absent for six hours. He just fell under the power and his spirit was caught up. And Jesus took him to the back of the throne room. Wow. And he took him to a compartment and he opened a huge window. And you look as far in the space as I could see, and Jesus said, Jesus said, We have come to this part of the universe to make the world where you are. We came from there. And he didn't bother his mind. Imagine there are other worlds. Have we not read in Hebrews 11, verse 3? By faith we know that the Worlds were framed by the word of God. Sadhu Sunda Singh, in his book, The Spiritual World, says, and when he was talking to Jesus, Jesus revealed himself and said, there are many other worlds he has made. That must be beyond even our universe. As far as man can see in this whole solar system, there doesn't seem to be any life. It must be further off. And he says, In your world, which I have made, I have chosen to reveal my attribute of love. But in other worlds, I have revealed my other attribute. Can you imagine? Other attributes which we can't even comprehend now. Everything in the Bible, Genesis, and Revelation, all that we know called the attributes of God, all tied up to one, love. Faith, love, and all these are tied up to one. There are many other aspects of God that we don't fully understand. So there is a God. Is a God we believe 
in a God. There are only three positions you can take in the world. You are either a theist, an atheist, or an agnostic. By choosing not to know anything, you are agnostic. So what in the world is that? A theist is someone who believes in God. An atheist is someone who says, I don't believe in God. An agnostic is say, I don't know and I don't care. So you are one of those positions. And so one day I met this atheist. I was a former atheist incidentally. Well, in my teenage life, too much time, too much education between atheists. And uh, so I met this atheist and he says, uh, I don't believe in God. Say, well, I do. And uh, say, prove to me that God exists. Yes. You prove to me that God does not exist. Draw. You can't prove that God doesn't exist. But if I want to, I could use proof to show God exists, but he wouldn't believe the proof anyway. But basically, I brought him to this point, where I said that to believe in God or not to believe in God, you still require faith. I use my faith to believe in a God. You use yours to believe there's no God. Draw. Wait, it's not a draw yet. That's round one. Round two, the referee blow his river. And he says, and I went on the set. If you don't believe there's a God, and in the end, when we all finally die and we find there's actually no God, no problem. But if I believe in God, and when we all die, and we go over there and we find there's a God, you are in trouble. Round two, ping, over. And so, and we enter round three. Ping. And he said, I look at him and say, look right into the eye. If I don't believe in a God, and you are just molecules and atoms and material, and there's no spirit, you're just flat. It makes me a cruel person. Because I can kill you, and you're just dust. It means nothing to me. I can be a very cruel person. I can kill. I can rock. And to me, all these are just physical material. And I said, because I believe in God, it makes me a better person. I fear the God to create this world. I want to obey the God to make this world. And society cannot run smoothly if people become cruel. You could be a murderer and say nothing about that because there is no eternal judgment. But because I believe in God, I become a better member of society. I become law abiding. I become caring because I know you are eternal. Silence on earth. Ding, round three. And uh, the next week or so, he came and he said, I want to believe in God. Bing! That was in his heart. And uh, so, round four, Jesus came into his heart. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, if we realize that there is a God, and here the Bible reveals God as three persons existing. Now, in the beginning, God, the Father, was called God. And let's see his name. So there was God, praise the Lord. There was God, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you. So in the beginning, there was God. All right. And then, uh, you come right here. Thank you. So this is the heavenly sphere, right? The translation, the heavenly sphere. Before the world exists, before anything exists, there was God, the Father. And there was God the Son. And uh, so God the Son, praise the Lord. And but in the in the beginning, and you can stand right here beside your dad. And there was God the Son. Let me see his father. Or the Son. <laughs> right. And uh, there was God the Son. But in the beginning of time, 
God the Son was not called God the Son. That name he only took after the New Testament. And we shall call his name Jesus. In the beginning his name was God the Word. He didn't have the title Son yet. Any reference to the Son in prophecy points to Jesus coming at the cross. And in the beginning, he was called God the Word. And that was his name. That is why John chapter 1 reveals the name of the second person of the Godhead. He is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. His name was the Word. In the book of Revelation, we read how later when Jesus comes with all his saints against the Antichrist, that uh, his name was written as the Word of God. So he takes back his original name, the Word. So in the beginning there was God the Word, and then there was God the Spirit. Praise the Lord, Banabim, praise the Lord. <laughs> and, uh, God the Spirit, that's the same as the same. God the Spirit. So, God the Father, God, God the Word, and God the Spirit. They confer together, and they say in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 26, Let us, see that point to the Trinity. It didn't say, let me. Let us make man in our image. That is Genesis chapter 1. But way back, we do not know how long, could have been millions of years, could have been thousands of years, in every time. Way back before God made anything, God made the angel. The archangel, the seraph, seraphim, the cherubim, and all these wonderful angels. God created all the angels. God created Michael, God created Gabriel, God created Lucifer. Lucifer, the shining one. These are angels, many, there could be more than three that we know. Only so far, so far three are known, but there could be more than that. And God created all these angels, and the angels constantly serve God. They constantly serve God. Right, praise God. Don't you mean standing there, please? Thank you. Well, the rest of us turn to the book of Ezekiel chapter 20 and Isaiah chapter 14. Praise the Lord. You are tired after the message by your lunch. <laughs> right. So anyway, Ezekiel chapter 28 God created all of the angels. Men did not come into the picture yet. And although this prophecy is a prophecy about Tyre, yet in time, it points back to Satan, who was formerly called Lucifer. See, God didn't create him as Satan. God created him as Lucifer, the shining one, the archangel. In verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sedia, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrel and pious was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers, I establish you. So God created Satan. See one hand on Ezekiel 28 and look at Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. It says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nation. So in the beginning of beginning, God created all these majestic looking angels. Archangels, cherubims, and seraphim, and all of them were out there serving God. We do not know how long Lucifer served God. But one day, Ezekiel 28 came to pass. Ezekiel 28, verse, let's read verse 15. You were perfect in your ways. You see, God didn't make imperfection, God made perfection. 
You were perfect in your way. From the day you were created, God created Lucifer perfect. He was not created imperfect or evil. He was created good. However, we must bear in mind that angels were created with a free will. They were created with a free will. We are created with a free will too, but we, we have something extra. We are created to touch the physical and the spiritual. They are created fully spiritual. It's a different, different creation of God. And so the angels are spirit. They have a spiritual body, but they don't have a physical body for hours. And uh, Ezekiel chapter 28 tells us that in verse 15, till iniquity was found in you. So one day, was serving God, Lucifer thought that he knew everything he needed to know about God. And said, how could you think of such a thing? Imagine, man today could think like that, how much more? A guy like Lucifer. He thought that we know everything about God. And he, did, he thought that there was no more to God that he needed to know. He thought he knew everything and he could usurp God's throne. Sin was found in him. Now let's define that. Sin is not a substance in the beginning. Sin is a condition. So did God create sin? No, sin don't have to be created. Sin is a condition, not a substance. If it's a substance, then there needs to be a creation. But sin is a condition. It's just like darkness is the condition of the absence of light. You don't have to create darkness. You remove the light and darkness comes. Darkness is not a substance. You don't find that you could go to a bright room, sit on darkness, and darkness comes. Mm-hmm. You are the room. Darkness is not a substance, it's a condition. It's a condition of the essence of life. So, to free choice, Lucifer chose to go on in his own. He chose to go on his own. And the moment he made that choice to move away, from obedience, darkness is the condition. Iniquity was found. So darkness and sin are conditions. However, if you read the Bible in the New Testament, you notice that sin later becomes described as if it has a personality. Especially in the book of Romans. It says how sin which works in the body Overcame Paul. What I do, I don't do, he says. But sin that is in me did it. So he gives the personality to sin. His sin and the power of darkness only became a personality after Satan fell. So Satan became, after he fell, the very personification of sin and evil. That is why if today Satan should appear to anybody, and then uh, he could appear as a shining one in, in camel cloud. But if you are discerning, you could detect darkness coming. If he becomes the very personification of that darkness, he is a living creature. But in the beginning, sin was a condition. Just a condition of state of being. Today it still is, but it's a subtle because there are real demons and there, there is a real devil now working in it as a force. And uh, so, there was Lucifer, and he plotted, according to the book of Revelation chapter 12, he plotted with all those other angels. And one third chose to go with him. And they all went after God, thinking that they, that's all they know about God. They think that was all God was. You see? And God took one look around. I don't know what God did. All God did is maybe just reveal more of his glory that Lucifer never saw before. And the judgment came on Lucifer and all his angels. One third of them. And all of them 
were judged. There is where Isaiah took place. Oh Lucifer, stand in the morning how you are fallen. So Lucifer was judged and he was cast out of God's presence. And so God in his in this place where he was, in whichever dispensation of space that he was in. And so God in his in this place where he was in whichever dispensation of space that he was in, he judged and he cast them out. Out! And they go. On this side of our Milky Way, of this galaxy, the yeah, universe is so big. And so this whole part of the universe was isolated and kept in prison. Uh, and kept in darkness under God's judgment. So Satan lost all his power, authority that he originally had with God. He became the personification of darkness. God just stuck him into that part of the universe. So the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, and the earth was without form, and darkness filled the whole world. Everything was chaos and void in this part of the universe. Everything was at the age. Judgment. And time stood still for a while. Until one day the universe was broken by the sound of the Godhead speaking. In Genesis 1, the Godhead came. Into that part of the all the other part of the universe had got light shining, the light giving light. But that part of the universe got saved. Let there be light and a silly, you know, Satan and all these angels, you know, we wonder what is happening. They flooded all with light. Now the light that God spoke was the creative light of God. It was not the sun's rays. It was not the photons and the and the ray sun rays that we know today. It was spiritual light. How do we know? Because the sun was not made yet. The sun was not created yet. It was created later in the book of Genesis. So there was a sort of creative light that filled that whole part of the universe, and then was Satan and all his one set of his angels crouching in fear, sitting, wondering what's going to go on. And suddenly they heard God beginning to create what we read about in Genesis chapter 1. God created the world and all these things which we saw the last session, and how he made the world and everything. Then God made the plant. Do you notice that the plants were made before the sun was made? See, today's world is not what God made it to be. If you take the plants away from sunlight, the process of photosynthesis which the plant depends on for survival stops, and you deprive your sunlight, it starts dying. But originally, all all living creatures had their life directly from God. So the plants exist because of God's life. So that was the perfect world God made. And God made all the world, and then God made man. Genesis 1, 26. Satan heard the sound. Let us make man in our image. Say, what? 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 He's watching. Watching. Watching the whole thing. He was still around. He was Watching. Put on his spiritual binoculars. Watching. Cloud. And, uh, you know, that reminds me of Snoopy on top of his dog house playing the voucher. And uh, so just watch it. And then God made man and everything there was. And God gave man authority and power. God gave the world's authority and power to, to Adam. And then God said, let them have dominion. Wow, Satan heard the word dominion. He got hungry. His saliva started dropping. That's what he wants, dominion. Dominion, wow. So then God left Adam to cheat. You know this, God asked him to cheat. Although Adam may not know, that word implies taking care of the whole place. Exercising his God-given authority. We don't know how, for how long they continue. 
But Satan, who had no power, no more authority, he did not even have his unindured authority. He was already cast out. That's why those who teach that Satan fear his unindured authority, they are not speaking it right. God's judgment struck him out. And what Satan did was, he crept into the Garden of Eden, and he saw and spied out all the scriptures. He figured out, if he's going to get man, he got to do it in a different style. And he saw one little creature called the serpent. We don't know how the serpent looked like. It could look like monkey, they look like snake. We don't know what it looked like. But in those days, all the animals could talk to one another. And they could talk to man. Is that right? Yes, yeah. the serpent talked to at least. They all talked one language. We don't know what language it was. When we get back to heaven, once again, it is restored. Robert Lydon, then he went to heaven, sat in a boat, and as he was going, past, going and joined the creation of John in paradise, the fish came out and said, Hello, Robert! It's even the fish talk. <laughs> and uh, today's world is fallen. It's not where God made it. So all the animals could talk. And Satan sneaked up. He saw that serpent and said, This is the one. <laughs> and and uh, he somehow got control of the serpent. And through the serpent, he came after Eve. Hid in the branches, waiting that forbidden fruit. Incidentally, it's not an apple. May have been a durian. No, it's not. And so, we do not know what it was. But that forbidden fruit. So, Adam and Eve were tempted. We read the story in Genesis 3 that they partook of the fruit, and the moment they did, all the authority transferred to Satan. All that belonged to them. So what Satan had was Adam's dominion and authority. Luke chapter 4 verse 6, Satan told Jesus, show him all the kingdoms of the world, and said all this glory and authority and power has been given unto me. The revised Berkeley version says, has been handed over to me. It could not have been God who handed it to him. Adam did. It was transferred over to Satan. And Satan began to have the dominion that formerly belonged to Adam and Eve. So there we have it. Adam and Eve became slaves and up under Satan. And Satan took domain of the whole creation. Since that first man fell in the sin, sin and death reigned in the world. Question is asked, why didn't God just step in? Why don't God the Father, God the Word, and God the Holy Spirit, just when they see that, they will just say, Hallelujah! And grab Satan. Tie him up. Throw him off. Why didn't God say we did it? If God did it, he would have to get rid of man too. Because man had become a part of Satan's kingdom. If God destroyed Satan at that time, he would have to destroy man too. In Matthew chapter 25, we are told that the lake of fire was created for Satan and his angels. It was never created for men. Remember this. God created the lake of fire not for men. For Satan and his angels. But Satan is trying to pull human souls into the lake of fire. That is speaking he has. But Peter to an extent. So God studies the whole picture. God the Father, God the Word, God the Holy Spirit, they confer together. Look at the whole situation. Of course, they knew before. It's a great wisdom. But I'm just giving a picture of their conference. And they realize there's one way we'll get it back. If they just come down straight away and grab it, if they send an angel, and an angel came down and, uh, yeah, oh, ah, throw Satan aside, all the authority will go back to angels, and men will have to be destroyed too. Homo sapiens will have to be destroyed too. So God confers 
One third. And incidentally, they, the world that was given to Adam, the authority that God gave Adam over this whole world, not turning it over to Adam, which Adam turned over to Satan, it was given least whole, not three whole. Least whole. Some believe it was least whole 6,000 years. Similarly that. But no one exactly knows when the 6,000 years begins and ends. So the world was given as least whole, not three whole to man. Satan knows that he got it over in a certain period. And when God had a plan and God said, it's alright, there's one way we could do it. We will, one of us will go in human flesh and overcome Satan in human flesh as a human being and thereby all the authority was transferred back to human beings. What a beautiful plan. God planned in that way. And so God waited his time and prepared and waited for the fullness of time. And when the fullness of time came, God sent one of his angels in Luke chapter 1 to Mary. And he comes to Mary, appears to Mary, right? And says, you know, Mary is a, thou art highly favored. And he says, in Luke 1, that the holy king, which God created, shall be called Jesus, or the Son of God. Look at Luke chapter 1 for a moment. Luke chapter 1. And it tells us in verse 34, Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I do not know a man? And in verse 35, the, Holy, the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. And therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. God says there will be a creation. That is why Jesus is called the second Adam. Why second Adam? Because God actually created a new body in Mary's womb. God has, could have taken man and made a body for Jesus and Jesus come. But he chose to make a body inside Mary's womb. That is what the Bible calls it here. In notice in verse 35, Luke. It says that Holy One. The new kingdom is right for life. Because it's the Holy One. In the old King James, it says the Holy King. How dare you call Jesus a thing? But in the Greek, it's the Holy King. The Holy Neutral Word. See, how could be a king? Because the body without the spirit is still lifeless. See, God did not create Jesus in the womb. God only created a body in the womb. Whether it's a one cell body, two cell body, multi cell body, it was just a physical body that God created. Without any part from Mary, without any part from Joseph, God created a new body. And having created a new body, God, the Father, God the Spirit, said to God the Word and said, All right, you, now go down into that body. So Hebrews chapter 10 took place in verse 5. Hebrews chapter 10. And it says, verse 5, Therefore when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. See, Jesus was not created. 
only the body he draw in was created. He was a different body, a new creation. He was a second Adam. So when Jesus did, he was God the Word. He took off his glory. John 17, he talked about his restoration of his glory. He took off what we call his omni. His omniscience, his omnipotence, and his omnipresence. He took off all his authority, power, glory, everything. And just the form of his spirit life came. And that body is created so the life of God, the word came. And he goes into the body of Mary. And so Mary is not the mother of God. So Jesus was not created in her. Only the body was created and Jesus spirit came into that body. Strictly speaking, technically speaking, Mary was just Mary's womb was just an incubator for the work of God to come through. That's all. It, the womb was just an incubator for the whole process to come in. She was not the mother of God. The God cannot be created. But the, the body was created and Jesus came down and entered that body. Whether it's a one cell body, two cell body, in the three world, it makes no difference. If 6,000 6, demons, one legion could draw in one man, you realize that in the spirit world there's no faith, like the king about in the natural. So the spirit of Jesus came. And that combination of the second person of the Godhead with human flesh became called Jesus. That's when the second person of the Godhead took a different name. He shall be called Jesus, which means God is our salvation. Christ, which means the anointed one. So he took on a new name. Jesus Christ. He lived on the planet Earth for 33 years. Waited on God and everything Jesus did while he was on Earth, he did it as a man. He didn't have any special God's right. But everything he did, he fulfilled as a man with the help of the Holy Spirit, which is available to any man who will yield to God. So he fulfilled everything he needed in, on this planet Earth. And finally, when he has walked on this Earth 33 years, when it's time for him to manifest himself, the Spirit of God came. Praise the Lord. And when he was 30 years old, the Spirit of God came upon Jesus and anointed him. That was how Jesus did all his work. As a man anointed by the Holy Spirit. So how did we know the world was lethal? See what God did when Jesus came. And Jesus anointed by the Holy Spirit started going out to do mighty work. The demons all had a shock. See how... How is it that you come before our time? Do you notice them saying that? In Matthew chapter 8, the demons scream and say, How is it that you come to torment us before our time? What time are they talking about? Remember we said, the earth was given in this hole. They know the leaf hole has not expired. Jesus was nearly 2,000 years ahead. So suddenly here comes Jesus before his leaves, so it's just like a landlord come to you before your your tenancy the agreement expire and come to drag you up. You say, hey, the lease agreement not ended yet. So that was a shock the demons were had. Say, so why are you coming to torment us before the time the lease has not ended yet? They knew. There's a time coming when Satan knows his time is coming short. And guess wow. And God could come on this planet. And so Jesus ran about doing all those things. It was a surprise. See, God, 
came as a man. God could come as God and take over when the Holy Soul expired. But God came as a man in human form. The all this mighty work and on the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ, on behalf of humanity, died, took our sin that we might be free. He overcame the devil as a man, not as God. He died on the cross as a sinless man for sinful men. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, He was made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. So Jesus Christ took our place. In John chapter 12, it says, The time has come, when he fought by the cross, when the prince of the power of the air will be cast when Satan will be cast out. He talked about the cross. See, when Jesus went to the cross and overcame Satan, as a man, as a man, tempted in every way but sinless, he took back all the power that belonged to Adam. Took back all the authority that belonged to Adam. Took back everything. And then he rose up. When he rose up, Praise the Lord. Praise God. You can turn around and go up. And he rose up and he went to heaven. The Bible says that in heaven, Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11 took place. God the Father proclaimed. See, when Jesus came down, he was just God in spirit form, emptying himself, Jesus coming in. But when Jesus rose up, a part of humanity went up with him. See, he's being raised as a man. And as a man, when he reached up there, he is restored back to his old glory. And God glorified human beings in Christ. God glorified Homo sapiens. Jesus still has that link with Homo sapiens. And Philippians 2 says, God the Father declared and said, Let all creatures let every tongue, let every being, let every creature on, in heaven, on earth, and underneath the earth glorify and bow to the name that is above every other name. He glorified the name Jesus Christ. See, that's, a, that, that's when the second person of the Godhead took on the name Jesus Christ. And today he's still known by that name. He's known as our Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead. He has his glory come back to him. God has brought the word glory come back. But he has brought up with him. Homo sapiens was exalted. And so because Jesus overcame Satan as a man, all the authorities came back to Homo sapiens. And he gave his authority and power back to us, Homo sapiens. If there's any human being who believes in Jesus now, that same authority that he has won back will be delegated to them. And it says, In my name, you shall cast out demons. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It says, Go and preach. Go and teach all nations. So he starts sending us out. And he says, everyone who believes in Jesus today, by believing in him, we believe in what he has done for us. And that right and authority that originally God made for us can come on us. And we can walk with the authority that God made for human beings to have. In the Old, Old Testament, Everyone who looks forward to Jesus Christ coming is saved. And in a new covenant, everyone who looks back is saved. 
I said in the old covenant, they didn't pay all the benefits. In the new, they start facing because the work of the cross has already been accomplished and finished, completed. Hallelujah. God has finished the whole redemption work. And now, the same spirit that helped Jesus, God sent the fullness of the spirit down when he, Jesus rose from the dead. He sent him down to this planet earth. And that same spirit can come on any human being to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior and come upon their lives and the same power and authority that Jesus used to overcome the devil will come upon their lives and they will be able to overcome Satan. And they will have authority over Satan. They will have authority over demon powers. And they will be able to walk on the planet Earth with the authority and power that God has originally designed for man to have. That's how God totally eradicated sin and removed it. So that it's available today to each one of us to believe. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Please. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for every heart and every life and every mind. We pray for those under the sound of my voice. We pray, O oh God, that if there any be any who have not come to know Jesus and His truth and His life, that right now, Father God, you begin to speak to the heart and life of each one. That you will cause a revelation to flow forth. And you will cause, O oh God, an understanding to come forth. Let the light of your gospel shine upon each one. And Father God, the light will enlighten its life. We pray, O oh Father God, that that stirring will begin. That same spirit that Jesus said, no man can come to the Father, that the Father draw him. That same spirit is drawing, Father God, all to know him. We pray, Father God, that your love begin to deal and come upon his life, Lord, even now. We thank you, Father God, for your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Would you be standing together with me? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus.
Deixa eu cuidar do arranjo. 